My guest today is Frank DeAngelis. Frank is a retired principal of Columbine High School in Littleton, Colorado, where he has served as principal between 1996 and 2014. He is presently serving as a consultant for safety and emergency management for the Jeffco School District in Colorado and for Safe and Sound Schools. He has transformed the school safety conversation worldwide. Frank has addressed numerous professional and school audiences on the topic of recovery after a school-based tragedy. He has visited, consulted with, and assisted school communities across the country following incidents of violence and tragedy, including Platte Canyon, Parkland, Sim School Highlands Ranch, Chardon, Virginia Tech, and Sandy Hook. I have personally heard him talk at a few Denver area keynotes and witnessed how he has maintained close ties with students who were in the Columbine shooting and who went to Columbine 21 years ago. Frank is truly an inspirational leader and guide to others in times of crisis. Welcome to the podcast, Frank. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor. Well, I, we've learned a lot. Just uh, I learned a lot from talking with you in the pre-chat and from some of your uh, keynotes. Uh, you talk a lot in those public speaking events about how you came out of the trenches yourself as the principal in the first uh, large-scale school shooting that we know about. And um, how did you come out of the trenches uh, following Columbine and learn how to take care of yourself while taking care of the community? Right. And that's probably one of my strongest messages. And it's really ironic right now that I'm working with a lot of school districts. And I look at the comparisons in the aftermath of what educators, uh, parents are facing now with the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And how do you take care of yourself? How do you, you know, I don't know if you ever return to normal, but how do you get to that point because uh, moving forward? And for me, it was real interesting after the Columbine tragedy happened, I think as a leader, one of the things that you feel is you have to take care of everyone. And I was being pulled in so many different directions. Uh, of course, my students, uh, the staff, you had community members, you had the parents, and trying to help all of them. And then in addition, your own family, and it was interesting, it was um, probably 24 hours after the shooting occurred and a friend of my mom, or my mom actually worked for him, he was a chiropractor, Dr. John Fisher. He was a Vietnam veteran and he called and he said, Frank, you're gonna be pulled in so many different directions, but I'm telling you, I'm begging you, if you don't take care of yourself, you're not gonna be able to take care of others. And he said, when I got back from Vietnam, I never got the help I needed and I'm paying the consequences you know, 20, 30 years later. And he said, you need to get that support system in place. So I heeded to his words and got into counseling immediately and was very helpful. And then also, again, um, something that was beneficial for me was my faith. And I know we're going to talk a little bit about that later, but it was those two things that actually gave me the strength to continue. And it's not that uh, the difficulties went away, but I had that support system in place, which is so instrumental. And I think in dealing with a lot of the issues we're dealing with right now, mm -hmm. administrators, educators need to find that support system. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like there was a lot more stigma um, 21 years ago when it came to getting mental health support? Most definitely. I actually had people tell me, you know, it's a sign of weakness. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's a sign of strength. Um, I look at it, there is no way I would have been able to fulfill my commitment to the Columbine community. I stayed for 15 years after uh, the tragedy occurred. And if I didn't have that support system in place, I would not have been able to do that. And I actually had someone tell me, Frank, if you talk to someone, you better not tell them because they can deem you unfit for duty. Mm -hmm. And I think so many times when we hear that, that we're afraid that if we seek that help, that that shows we're weak and it's not. Um, you know, we're dealing with things that you need professional help. Mm -hmm. And I know people always tell me, and, and it's important, your family and friends are important, but I've had people say, well, you know, I have a strong support system. I have my, my spouse, you know, I have my significant other, I have my best friend. And I said, that's wonderful. But if you broke your arm, would you allow your wife or your husband or your best friend? They said, well, that's crazy. I would never allow them to do it. I need a doctor. And I said, then why would you entrust your well-being, your mental health being, your social well-being to someone that has not been trained? 
And it's having all those different avenues. It's not one size is going to fit all. It's not that one thing's going to fit all. So you need to find that support system. And, and unfortunately, the thing that I learned is you're not going to wake up someday and everything's going to be back to what it was. And I got to tell you, this is what I learned through my counselor. 21 years later, I'm still in counseling. And every event that happens re-traumatizes me. Um, here's a good example. Uh, it's timely. But today, um, I had a staff member who worked at Columbine, and unfortunately, she passed away. Well, they had a service today, and I just returned from the service over at West Bowles Community Church. And the reason I'm sharing this story is that was a place that our staff and students congregated after Columbine prior to going over to Chatfield High School. And it was eerie because there were a handful of people that were there on the 20th that, that were there today and kind of looked at each other. And I said, boy, I started feeling some things I hadn't felt in a while. Mm -hmm. And even though it's 2000, it's whatever, June 22nd, 2000, it took me back to April 22nd of 1999, mm -hmm. just being in that auditorium, being there. And for me, what I have is what I learned from my counselors. I have something called touchstones. And all of a sudden, I'm standing in that foray, and I start holding onto these medals. Mm -hmm. And for me, it was, this is not April 22nd, 1999. This is, you know, June 22nd, 2020. And it helped me to get to where I needed to be. But I could not have done that on my own without the help of counseling. So I cannot stress the importance of getting that help you need. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's certainly shown how you've been uh, you've been able to persevere and be that leader that people look up to and, and that can speak and assist others in tragedy and how interesting, you know, you have that something, something you can touch and, and just kind of center yourself with when you feel like you're in that situation. Um, thinking about um, how social media was not really a part of our day-to-day -day culture back in 1999 and how it's really shaped uh, people's reactions to uh, school shooting, how how do you think social media has heightened the issue of preventions of school shootings and uh, people's reactions as opposed to when you uh, were a principal in 1999? Right. And I'm trying to think back to that time. And I think the only social media that I remember, I think it was MySpace. Mm -hmm. And that was about it. And we did not. Uh, it's interesting because back in the day, and people ask me this question all the time, you know, Columbine occurred 21 years later, and I know in the introduction you named many of the places in which there's been school shootings, but it seems that the word Columbine resonates with school shootings. And I think part of that, people ask me why, uh, and I think part of that is the fact, the role that the 24-7 news cycle brought in. Mm -hmm. It was the first time that they actually brought everything that was happening into the living rooms. And I'm amazed when I go out and do presentations, people will come up to me and state, gosh, Frank, I remember where I was when the shooting occurred. You know, for me, some milestones in my life, I remember where I was when President Kennedy was assassinated or the Challenger exploded or 9-11. Well, many people refer back to Columbine. Mm -hmm. And it was just the, the media, the 24-7 news cycle. But now, every event that happens, it's at your disposal instantly. And there's so many, you know, we hear some of the bad things with social media, but there are good things. The thing that I've learned just over the years, and again, I'm not an expert, but the one thing that I've learned is so many of these shooters are broadcasting. Mm -hmm. And I think the important thing that we need to share with our students, uh, with our parents, if, you know, I remember talking to someone from Parkland, it was a parent who said, you know, see something, say something, and then as adults, we need to do something. Mm -hmm. And so, so many times if kids see things on social media, hopefully uh, they'll share that. And we're fortunate in the state of Colorado, we have a program called Safe to Tell, which is a 24-7 anonymous tip line. And I can't tell you the number of lives that have been saved. You know, even when I was at Columbine High School, getting tips, uh, for example, uh, some of the students would say, I'm really concerned about a posting my friend had on, you know, whether it be not necessarily Facebook at this point, but Insta uh, Instagram or Snapchat. And, you know, just some of the things they saw some of the signs that this person may be thinking of hurting him or herself and um, turned it into safe to tell they did a welfare check. And I think even if my memory serves me correctly, there was a situation in Douglas County 
uh, with some girls that were planting another columbine. And some people saw it as a threat and reported it. And it's, you know, it's really, reporting really saves lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're so grateful to have those systems in place in Colorado and many other states have something similar where you, know, you can put that anonymous tip in. Um, you know, there's so much that goes around on social media and kids don't often have that filter and they'll say anything or, you know, they, they feel a certain way, you know, they, they might want to commit suicide, they might want to threaten other people and that'll come out on social media. So, um, you know, it's very good compared to, you know, 21 years ago that we have that option to uh, be able to report anonymously. Um, thinking about um, something you mentioned um, after the first question, uh, you talked to me a lot about how faith, family, and friends has really uh, helped drive you forward um, throughout your career and now as a consultant. Um, how has that given you such tenacity in the work that you do now? Well, again, you know, when I go out and present, I'm, I'm very open and upfront. And again, my message is really, you need to find that support system. Hopefully you have strong, strong family support and then the counseling piece. And something that was important for me is my faith. And it's not for everyone, but you, you need to find that piece that'll help in the healing process. And for me, I'm a cradle Catholic, and uh, I can remember after the Columbine tragedy, for the first time in my life, uh, I was questioning my faith because I can remember going to my brother's home that night. My wife and I could not go to our house because the uh, police were concerned about the self, our safety and well-being. And as I'm sitting there, I'm questioning, you know, my faith saying, God, how could you allow this to happen? You know, what I witnessed that day, uh, the damage that had been done, the children who had lost their lives, Mr. Sanders, one of my dear friends, lost his life. And on that day, I was in my office when I was informed by my secretary that there had been a report of gunfire. And, and I had been in Columbine 20 years prior mm -hmm. to the tragedy. I had taught social studies and I was an assistant football head baseball coach. And so this was my second family. And what resonated in my mind when I heard that is this has to be a senior prank mm -hmm. because I could count on two hands a number of fist fights, any type of acts of violent. I mean, we did not, not accustomed to that in our community. And I share this all the time that if you would have told me a Columbine could have happened at Columbine, I would have said, no, it doesn't happen in this community. Mm -hmm. There's so many of these other communities will make that same statement. So anyway, I'm sitting in my office and when I come running out of my office, my worst nightmare became a, a reality because I'm encountering the gunman. Mm -hmm. And I started going through you know, what I later learned was fight, flight, and freeze, and everything seemed to slow down. But here's where my faith component comes in. There were about 25 to 30 girls that were coming out of a locker room to go to a physical education class and unaware of what was transpiring. And all of a sudden, they're coming right in the crossfire of the gunman. And so I run immediately towards them because they're my kids. And I have police officers saying, Frank, why would you go after we run towards a gunman unarmed. And I said, because that's what we do as educators. We put our lives on the line for our kids. And so I get down to the hallway and I knew if I could get our girls, my girls into the gym, lock the doors, there was an exit to the outside that at least we could get to a safe place. And everything was going as planned until I go to pull on the gymnasium door and it's locked. So we're trapped in this little alcove. Uh, we hear the gunman, the shots, sounds the shots getting louder literally hear the boots pounding on the tile or the floor coming down the hallway. And all of a sudden, the door's locked, girls are screaming. I reached my pocket and I literally had 25 to 30 keys on a key ring. Mm -hmm. And I reached my pocket, stuck my hand in the pocket. First key I pulled out, it opened the door on the first try. And I truly believe that if I would have stumbled around and couldn't find that key, I wouldn't be doing this in a podcast with you. And it was interesting, last year uh, was a 20 year remembrance and many of those girls that were with me that day, uh, we kind of had a remembrance, um, not a reunion, but we all got together and mm -hmm. they came up and they were introducing me to their families and they said, Mr. D, if it wasn't for you finding that key, we wouldn't, my family wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be able to hug my kids at night. And I said, I had very little to do with that. Mm -hmm. And I really believe on that day that I was being protected. But even though that plays out in my mind now, right after, I was struggling. 
-hmm. And it was two days after I went down to my local parish in Littleton, St. Francis Cabrini, and it was on a Thursday night in Father Ken Leone. There was about 1,200 people in Sacristy, and he called me up on the altar, and he said, Frank, and many of my students were there that were part of the youth group, and he whispered in my ear, and he said, Frank, you know, you should have died that day. I mean, you had every reason to lose your life, but God's got a plan. He saved you. Now you need to rebuild that community. Mm -hmm. And I remember this quote so well. It's Proverbs 16, 90. He said, it's hard a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. And he said, God is, there's going to be tough times and you're going to fall and you're going to get knocked down, but Jesus is going to be there to protect you. And so it was that, that, spiritual support that I had that really allowed me to continue and it continues today you know after each and every time and so I really feel with all the three things that I talked about faith family and friends you know it, it really has helped me get to where I was uh, back then 15 years later 21 years later and I, I made a commitment the night those girls passed away when I had or the children all the children passed away and I had to break that news to the parents. I made a, a promise to them that night that there's nothing I can do to bring them back. But I'm gonna make sure they didn't die in vain. And that's why I continue to do what I'm doing now. Hopefully sh share some of my knowledge to help people overcome things such as the Columbine or what we're going through right now. Yes, now that's such an inspiring story. I remember hearing you share that uh, at one of the keynotes about that gym a key and you know it was truly an act of god the fact that you found the right key i mean it could have taken five minutes but you found the right key and you were saved and yes there's definitely you know god had something in plan for you um and you've inspired so many and helped out in so many ways um as we uh talk a little bit about current events with the covid and uh social justice education uh there are many principals um that are wondering as we return in the fall how do you meet the needs of both uh, staff and students? Because uh, we always talk about trauma-informed practices and social-emotional uh, strategies for teaching, but we, we don't really talk about taking care of staff as well. And I think that's so important. Uh, you know, one of the things in meeting with uh, CASE, which is the Colorado Association of Secondary Executives, School Executives, and, and people around the country, that's important. I think. What you need to not, I know what we need to do is during professional development, you do things to address uh, pedagogy and things of that nature, but we also need to talk about the social emotional well being of the staff members mm -hmm. because they're going to be facing things that they have probably never faced in their careers. And, and we learn this wholeheartedly. Um, the students, when they returned, they were not the same as when they walked out of the building on, or ran out of the building on April 20th. Well, I think what we're going to see as staff members, I think parents are seeing it right now. And mm -hmm. I think the thing that you're going to see is they're going to be different than what, when they saw them the last time around March 13th. Mm -hmm. And so those teachers, their days are going to be drawn out. And I, the thing that's so concerning in situations like this is the uncertainty mm -hmm. because so many times as educators so many times as principals you feel you're somewhat in control whether it be you know you got a plan we're going to do this the first week we're going to do this second week teachers they have their plan laid out for nine weeks for the semester and all of a sudden that's changed because there'll be an event all of a sudden and who knows uh, if the school's going to take place in person or right back to remote you know remote learning and so all of a sudden when t teachers lose that control or administrators lose that control they need to make sure that they have things in place to be able to deal with the situations and, and i think that's so important you know and one of the things that i learned is especially in situations where you feel you don't have control people don't want to be told what to do mm -hmm. and i learned very e early on I could not get in front of my staff and say to them, man, you're messed up. You better get some help because people are going to dig their heels in and say, no one's telling me how to feel. But when I change that scenario and I change that dialogue and I would say, boy, I don't know what you're feeling, but gosh, I haven't ate. I haven't eaten in a couple of weeks or a couple of days. I haven't slept. And you see the heads nodding. Mm -hmm. And because so many times I think we feel we're on this journey or on this trip alone and we're not. And so I think it's important being able to take care. And you know, one of the things that you hope is 
when we start getting back to a semblance of normalcy, there's going to be bumps in the road. And that's the key where taking care of yourself, having that support system in place is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think definitely for um, teams and uh, just staff members that are kind of out on an island, you know, whether they teach electives or, um, you know, they're, they're part-time staff members. I think uh, all schools should look into ways of just connecting with those staff members who aren't necessarily there every day or don't necessarily teach in a team. So uh, that's a great perspective to think about as we, um, you know, learn how to take care of others and, and you know, look out for that teacher who, you know, seems like, you know, something's going on. And, well, and, you know, and one of the things, Dana, that's so important is the fact that this was a, a hard lesson for me to learn, mm -hmm. but everybody experiences things differently. It could be the same event. Mm -hmm. And I'll use the pandemic as an example. Um, you know, you're going to have some people that feel, gosh, I need support. We need to, I'm sure there's staff members that really felt, boy, we need to do Zoom meetings every day. There, we need it. We need the support. We need the support. We have others saying, the sooner I get back to doing what I was doing at the beginning of March, that's going to help me heal. And you're going to have some people in between. And so as administrators, that's one of the things that was so difficult, trying to meet the needs of everyone. Well, as teachers, it's the same thing. You're going to have all these students that are coming into your classroom. You're going to have administrators are going to have all these students walking into your school, and every experience is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. And I think as staff members, hopefully the ones that you're talking about that may only be there part time, finding out because we don't know what their experiences have been. You know, did they lose a loved one to? the coronavirus, you know, with some of the things right now with the social injustice going on, are they affected by that? And so, you know, taking care of the well-being, because once again, you know, as I state time and time again with students, if kids don't feel safe, if uh, students feel hungry, you know, the math and science of curriculum is not going to happen. And it's the same thing with staff members. If they're, if they're hurting emotionally, it's going to be difficult. And then you also wonder, um, and I know districts are going to have to make some decisions about staff members that do not feel comfortable returning. I know just at Columbine High School, there's some staff members that are battling with some health issues, mm -hmm. you know, in remission and things like this nature. And I think they're, they're justified in asking, is it going to be safe for me to return to the building? Because do I want to put my life at risk and my mm -hmm. family's life? So these are all questions that, it, to the best of my knowledge, we have not had to answer as educators. No, and there's a lot of things, you know, that we're still pondering and figuring out in the next seven weeks that we have in Colorado until school starts. So, um, you know, hopefully those things will reveal themselves more as time goes on. Yeah, we start in Douglas County in seven weeks. You guys have until the end of August in DEFCO, I think. But yeah, the summer goes by quickly, and we've never done so much planning in the summer as now for just all those various scenarios that may take place. Yeah, and I think Jeffco is going to start um, August 24th. It's a week later. Mm -hmm. But it was real interesting. I was talking to a friend of mine. Um, we were principals together when I was working, and he rolled out something to me that was real interesting. He said, sometimes I think it might not be a bad idea to start a little bit later, September 15th, to see you know, and you could still cut back on some of your vacation time and things like that, but to learn from others prior, because I think the first group that goes back in, there's going to be some things that they learn. And I don't know which school district is going to be the first to return, but I think they're going to learn, you know, boy, we really learned from this. It's like for me, when I talk to people from Sandy Hook or Parkland, I said, these are some of the things I learned from. Well, whatever school district, because not every school district starting on the same day, whether it be if it's Denver or it's Duck Co or what that school district, if they start a week or two weeks before, I'm sure they're going to learn some things saying, boy, this is what we learned. We didn't expect. And, you know, there's so many positive things during these difficult times. But one of the things that I try to do is instill hope mm -hmm. in people's lives. And I look back, you know, we, we talk about Columbine and after Columbine, I made the comment that I just joined a club in which no one wants to be a member. Yeah. And I can remember trying to cope. And I did receive phone calls from, you know, Bill Bond, who was a principal at Heath High School of Paducah. We shared some common themes. But my point being, right now, all educators 
administrators, superintendents, school board members, teachers, we're all facing this, not only within the state of Colorado, but around the country, around the world, and we're learning. And, you know, just as we're learning from some other countries in which the pandemic broke out much earlier, and we're learning and we continue to learn, and I think as education, educators, what we need to do is learn from each other. Mm -hmm. And I just, I think school districts are doing this, but to me, if you have, I don't know, I think there's over 170, 180 school districts in the state of Colorado. Well, instead of having 184 plans, hopefully we can come together saying, boy, this has really worked for us. It not necessarily, and then you break that down to rural communities or smaller schools or larger schools, suburban schools, inner city schools. And I think we can learn from each other and work on the best things that work because the bottom line is they're all of our kids and what are we gonna do for them? Yeah, because we're dealing with a lot of the same scenarios with you know reducing number of desks in classrooms, whether to ask kids to wear masks or not, you know, social distancing, use of the cafeteria, all those types of things. We're dealing with all the same issues, whether or not we have a, a high school of 2,000 plus students or a high school of 30 students, right? So. Well, and you know, and one of the things too, I've kind of warned educators, there may be a sense of rebellion, mm -hmm. especially amongst high school and possibly middle school kids. And what I mean by that is after Columbine, when we returned to Columbine High School in August of 1999, we were probably the safest school in the world. Mm -hmm. And the parents wanted to hear that. But as time went on, the students were getting a little bit rebellious from the standpoint that they would say, Mr. D, this isn't like a school anymore. It's almost like an institution. And we have all these rules and this, it's, I mean, these, all these rules in the, uh, the climate, zero tolerance and all these things. I mean, th this isn't what I want. Mm -hmm. and, there, and what necessarily what the adults wanted and what the students wanted were two different things. And one of the recommendations that I'm giving to some of these administrators and superintendents is make sure you include students in some of these conversations going back. Now, mind you, you have to follow the guidelines. Mm -hmm. You know, with the state saying you can only have so many students in this class, you need to mask. But if there are some things that you can say, students, tell us, what do you think can work under these guidelines? Because that's important. Mm -hmm. And we saw, like I said, the students were very concerned. And now, in addition, you add to the fact that older kids have a tendency to, I mean, and I'm so proud of them standing up for what they believe, but you know, some of the social injustices we're dealing with right now as a country, that when returning to school in the fall, you know, that's probably gonna bring up some things. And I think back to um, back in, it, was, it would have been right after Parkland, which was uh, Valentine's Day, February 14, 2018. And, mm -hmm. and I know in the state, I think not only in the state of Colorado, but around the country, a month later, there was a walkout. Mm -hmm. you know? And kids needed to voice their concerns about you know, the injustices that were going on. And I think there's a real possibility that when students return to school, especially, you know, whether it be middle school or especially high school, you could see some of these demonstrations happening over policies and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And these are things that, you know, we have not had to deal with on a regular basis. Yeah, but I think it's a positive thing that kids are now knowing that they can voice their opinions and they can speak out. Um, but I see, you know, right now with the planning going on, that's, that is taking place by the adults, right? There are a few student advisory committees. I know some districts meet with, some superintendents meet with, but uh, there's such a small percentage <laughs> of all the adults that are working on the contingency plans. Um, we talked a little bit in the uh, pre-chat also about SROs and um, just uh, how important they are in, at campuses in Colorado. Uh, what's your perspective on having SROs at secondary campuses and how they support uh, the staff that, that you work with? I am a strong advocate for the school resource officers and I do some work with the National Association of School Resource Officers and I think it's important uh, I'm talking about the experiences that I had with the school resource officers in Jefferson County uh, at Columbine High School and I think it's so important that um, 
not all police officers are meant to be school resource officers, mm -hmm. but I do know the ones that go through the accreditation, the national accreditation, it takes a special officer. And I know I had the good fortune over my, you know, the 20 plus years in which they were installed at Columbine High School, they were fantastic. They were part of our staff. And I mean, we had them teaching classes. We had them show up, go to our dances. They went to games that they were, a, you know, that one adult that many of our students turned to. And it was a fantastic working relationships with them, with them. And I think back, not to dwell upon what happened at Columbine, but on that day, we did have a school resource officer on campus who was exchanging gunfire with the two gunmen. Now, unfortunately, the protocol at that time was to secure the perimeter. And he was being told, along with the other responding officers, that they could not go into the building until the SWAT team arrived. Well, unfortunately, by the time the SWAT team arrived, 13 people had lost their lives. Well, if you fast forward now, and I truly believe in my hearts of heart, that if the plan that's in place now, single officers going in, we would not have lost 13 by having that school resource officer there. And so I, I'm a strong proponent of it. And they're, they're a valuable resource and they work very well. And the experiences that we had with our school resource officers at Columbine and throughout Jefferson County was just fantastic. And I, I'm a strong proponent. Yes. And like you pointed out, there it takes a certain type of SRO to work with the students. And they often feel like family at that school. And you know, they know the kids, they build relationships with the kids. So uh, we're lucky in Colorado to have um, you know, a lot of uh, good support for the SROs at our high schools and most of our middle schools. Um, of everything we discussed on the podcast today, what's one thing you especially want listeners to remember? Oh, never give up hope. You know, one of the things that's important is um, I really believe this. I refuse to be helpless and hopeless. And I know these are trying times, but I truly believe that the thing we need right now is unity and not division and never give up that hope. And if I could offer a bit of hope is I can assure you 21 years after what happened at Columbine, our community is stronger than what it was prior because we came together. And during difficult times, we come together as family, we come together as communities. You know, I think back to what happened after 9-11. I never saw our country so unified that they put their political views aside to come together because we felt we were violated by the enemy, the terrorists. Well, now this terrorist act is the pandemic. Mm -hmm. That's our enemy. How do we overcome that? And then you add our country needs to come together over these social injustices. And, you know, one of the heartwarming things that I've seen to come out of many of the things that happened as a result of the, the unfortunate and sad death of George Floyd is to see police officers hooking arms with the community members marching together. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's all about because we're all together and you know to lose another life we just can't do that and we can't give up the fight and you know i i, I really believe in our lives we spend about 95 percent of our time dealing with five percent of the negative people and negative things that happen that you're never going to change mm -hmm. and to me that's wasted energy and not that you're going to dismiss anyone but you can decide whether or not you're going to build upon the positive or dwell on the negative. And I chose not to dwell on the negative, but build upon the positive. And what I tried to look for is energy givers and not energy takers. Mm -hmm. And I, I refuse to give up hope. I can't. That's not how I live my life. And moving forward, I know there's tough times and, you know, being quarantined and things of that nature. But someone gave me a quote, every day may not be good, but there's something good in every day. And that's what I look for. When someone said, well, what about this? And I said, yeah, but tell me something positive. And I know there's some days it seems like it's never going to happen. That you're never going to see positive again. But I'll guarantee you there's positive things. And it may come in baby steps. And it may be things out of our control. But we can't give up hope. Mm -hmm. Now, those are great words to live by. And just thinking of how, you know, overcoming tough times, just like 
all these educators right now going through uncertainty and uh, everybody that was quarantined and you know now uncertainty as school starts so yeah I think it's great great to think of you know what what, what is a positive that's come out of this and how how we unify as communities now well I thank you so much for being on the out of the trenches podcast where can people find you online oh geez um I'm trying to think what I have coming up. Uh, I'll tell you, I, one of the many positive things, I've been retired for six years, but this pandemic has really forced me to be retired. And a lot of my friends, uh, my family, my wife was concerned, and I'm handling this pretty well. Uh -huh. I'm enjoying some things I never had, I felt I never had time to do. But, uh, you know, my uh, email address is frankdeanslis1 at yahoo.com. Also, uh, not to be self-promoting, but I did publish a book back in, it was um, last year, March of 2019. It's called They Call Me Mr. D, and it's the story of Columbine's heart, resilience, and recovery. And any proceeds from the sales go to the Columbine Permanent Memorial. And it kind of, it's a book of hope and resilience and many things we're talking about right now. So. Mm -hmm. Well, it was great speaking with you today, and I hope you have a great rest of your summer and have a little bit of time to enjoy your retirement some more. Thank you so much, and thanks for all you're doing. I appreciate it. If you need anything, let me know. Thank you.